Hey everybody, it's Talk Gnosis, and today we are talking to Phil Hine, a guest I've been meaning to have on for years, but we've got a great reason to speak to him today. He has an awesome new book about the history of chakras in Western thought. Hi, Phil. Thanks so much for joining us. Why? So we'll dive right into it, which is tell us about the book, the title of the book, where people can get the book, and most importantly, what inspired you? Okay, well, the book is called Wheels Within Wheels, Chakras and Western Esotericism, and it's available directly from Amazon, either as a print paperback or as a digital copy. Cool. So that's the marketing bit out of the way. Why did I write the book? Well, I've been interested in, in chakras for quite a while now, particularly the, if you like the distinction between how chakras are perceived in the West, how they're represented it, and how they appear in, in the tantric traditions, two very separate things. And in 2018, I decided to do a, a series of lectures charting this passage of information about chakras in, into Western esotericism. So the first lecture was a kind of a, a very brief, if you like, an overview of how chakras are seen in the tantric traditions. Obviously, that's a fast subject, so I was only scratching the surface. And the other three lectures dealt with how chakras were taken up by various Western esoteric communities, such as the Theosophical Society, James M. Price, Crowley, etc., etc., and, and ending up with Carl Gustav Jung. Now, when I was planning these lectures, a friend of mine, David Southwell, whose fault all this really is, said, why don't you do the lecture? Do a little booklet for each lecture so you can, you know, when you go to the second lecture, you can sell a booklet of the first lecture. And I thought, well, you know, that's a great idea. I hadn't done any self-publishing for decades, so I thought that would be a good idea as well. So this is what I did. For each successive lecture, I produced a little booklet. So there were four booklets in all, each, you know, like lecture one, two, three, four. And I, I put these out for a while through Treadwell's Bookshop, which are the place where I'd done the lectures. And then eventually what happened was the print producer I used to produce these booklets put their prices up to a point where I thought, well, you know, I can't actually charge too much for these things because they're only little, you know, like 36 page booklets. I felt crap charging, you know, over a certain amount for them. So I thought, well, why not put them all into one book, add some material that I hadn't had time to cover in the original lectures and put it out as a single book because by that time I'd started my own small publishing imprint. I'd already produced two books, actually not three. So I thought, you know, collecting the, all the chakra stuff into one book made a lot of sense. Hence the present book. Very cool. Very cool. And, you know, talk about the commercial that, that you opened with, uh, I'll contribute to the commercial, which is, folks, you should definitely pick up this book. It's a, it's a relatively quick read, right? It's been maybe about 150 pages. And even though, I should say even though, but it's, it's, it's a, basically a book of history. But it, it's very entertainingly written. you got big personalities, big ideas. It, it's a fun read. Uh, so for, for anybody who's intimidated about sitting down and, and reading a, a book about the history of ideas, it's not an enormous tome. It's not a dry tome, so folks, if you have even the slightest interest in spiritual practice and chakras, you, you should definitely get it. But uh, for those people who are tuning into the show, perhaps have never heard of chakras before, I guess I kind of want to start at what they would maybe hear from somebody uh, who is a esoteric practitioner, somebody who is a yoga instructor, somebody who is working in an esoteric bookstore. Yeah, basically what I'm looking for, Phil, can you give me the elevator speech of what the, the more mainstream and popular the West understanding of chakras is? Like if I if I grab the random book for the New Age section on chakras, like what, what would it tell me? Okay, well, I looked at some New Age books on chakras that I had, so I think I can answer that. A book would probably tell you that there are seven chakras in the human body, you know, going from the base of the spine up to the crown of the head, the lower ones that you do with, you know, material stuff and emotional stuff, and the higher ones that you do with spiritual things, whatever that means. They will, might tell you that if you had certain problems in your life, this is due to your chakras being imbalanced and, you know, you have to balance them up. They might tell you that the base chakra, the muladhara chakra, is related to survival needs or financial problems, 
one book I read whilst I was researching the series said that, you know, if you have difficulty with money, that's because your muladhara chakra is blocked. And what you need to do is to open up the chakra and balance it, and your money problems will possibly go away, you know. Stuff like that. They might relate the chakras to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, you know, the kind of base survival insects up to the transcendental self-actualization experience. They certainly, I think, would relate them to different types of psychologies. They might throw crystals in there, all kinds of stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've seen chakra cakes and chakra teas and chakra apps, and, you know, it's a massive industry. Yes. So I, I guess uh, what we're going to dive into is, is how perhaps it's those ideas about chakras uh, are dissimilar, an evolution, a misunderstanding, a transformation of, of some, some South Asian, Eastern, for want of a better term, tantric ideas. And this is a huge question, but before we, we get to that understanding, we have to understand a bit about what tantra is. Phil, can you, can you tell us what tantra is? That's often a very difficult question as well. I can give you my, if you like, potted answer to that. It might not please everybody, but there you go. The, the Chantra is a name we give to a cluster of pan-Asian esoteric religious traditions. They start off about 5th, 6th century of the Common Era, depending who you believe, become enormously popular throughout South Asia, they began in the Shaiva religion, which was a, a theistic religion that was very popular at the time, and then they spread outwards. So you get Buddhist tantras, Jain tantras even. In a very short time, you get a very rapid plurif plurif sorry, plurif a rapid bunch of systems, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Struggling with my English today kind of diverge from each other in, in significant ways. So you get all kinds of different worship of different deities. Goddess worship, for example, becomes extremely popular. Some of these traditions are very kind of like public, if you like. They, they're they involved with the state with a, with the state or with public temple worship. Some of them are more private, esoteric, and tend to get a reputation for doing dubious things very quickly, like kind of like, uh, bizarre rituals in the cremation ground and sexual rituals and stuff like that. You know, but uh, again, even these more esoteric traditions often had some tie with the state. So you, we find tantric practitioners acting as, if you like, court advisors to kings or court sorcerers to kings. You know, they're not kind of like out on the margin. They might do weird things, even things that. People it's not that weird, but they're still kind of like involved in the in the political society of the period. And these traditions continue, kind of like merge and match in different ways. After the Muslim invasion of India, a lot of the temple structures and political structures that supported these traditions kind of like collapsed. But the, the tradition the traditions continue and they continue to proliferate and kind of like mix and merge with the new if you like, the new religious traditions that, that come in after the Mughal Empire is established in India. And these traditions still carry on today. They're not, you know, they've developed, obviously, as, as you might any religious tradition that's lasted over a thousand years, but they're still around in various ways. Yeah. So can you tell us, again, that I'm asking huge questions. We'd love to ask enormous questions on this show, Phil. But do your best to, to get it into bite-sized or to, to have it less than five hours, even though I know it's difficult. So so we talked about the, the kind of, quote-unquote, standard, quote-unquote, Western understanding of chakras. What are, what, are the, what are the tantric understanding, or I should say, understandings of chakras? Yeah, that's very true, understand this, because there are, there are some common elements, but, you know, the, tr the different traditions have different models of chakras, so you, you have different numbers of chakras. Some of the early traditions have five chakras and then nine, 10, 12, you know, whatever. But chakras are part of this, what we call in the West, the subtle body. And this isn't something that is just there. It's created through visualization and yoga. So you don't start off with a subtle body. You kind of build one through your practice. And the elements of, of that subtle body are very fluid. So you, you can actually have one kind of subtle body that pertains to a particular set of practices, and then if you're doing different practices, you get a different subtle body. But there are commonalities. 
And one of the things that the chakras appear in is this very core concept to a lot of the tantric traditions, which is called the divinization of the body. The idea is to effectively worship a god, you have to become like that god. So that means that you mirror, if you like, elements of the divine into your own body. And there are extremely ex complicated and extensive rituals for doing this. And one of them is, is to meditate on the deities that reside in the chakras. And according to different systems, there's different deities that reside in these chakras, and they rule, if you like, parts of our, our bodily and spiritual and psychological experience. Cool. And does that make sense? It, it does. Yeah, it, it does. And for the, the deities associated with the chakras, is, is it an element of discovering that they're already there, or are we bringing them into the subtle body, installing them in, in a sense? Well, if you read the text, the texts say that they are already there. But of course, what deities are, are present in which chakra depends on particular traditions. But, you know, there's a very simple exercise that I've been doing for years, and that is to place the, the, the deities that I have a particular connection with in my heart. Because the heart is the seat of consciousness in, in India thought, not, not the brain, it's the heart. So you, you visualize your chosen, your Ishta Devata, your chosen deity, as residing in your heart. And that is the seat of yourself and your connection with everything else, if you like. And that's a very simple exercise. Well, that's kind of the sort of thing you're doing when you're visualizing a deity present in your chakras. And, you know, obviously that creates effective emotional experiences. Right, of course, of course. So I, I guess now it's it's the story of, of how chakras sort of got into to Western thought, how they transformed from the idea that you just explained up to the idea that we opened with. And I guess it's best to start with the Theosophists. How did the Theosophists get interested in chakras? How did they bring it into their understanding and into their... Uh, well, it all starts, I think, in the middle of the 19th century. I, I've covered this in the book. There was a, an article in the, in the in a magazine called The Dubliner called The, the Dream of Ravan. And we don't know who wrote it. You know, Obviously, somebody who was kind of like very well read in Indian philosophy. This was the, the first article, or at least the first article that I'm with, that mentions chakras and kundalini. I think this was reprinted in a in a theosophical journal, and they kind of went, wow, what's what's all this stuff? You know. And then the in the article I in the reprint I read at the end of it, the guy who'd republished this article said, you know, can our Indian brothers in the Theosophical Society shed more light on this? And of course, that's what happened. So what you have to remember at this time is, is that the Theosophical Society was becoming very popular in India, and it had hundreds, you know, later thousands of Indian members. Indian Theosophical members started to write about what they knew about the chakras in articles in the, in the Theosophical Journal. And, you know, this was really exciting stuff. There's a key text is the, the Sh Chakra Nirupana Ch uh, Chantra, Sorry, the no Chakra Nirupada, which is is part of a of a book, yeah, a book on yoga by a, a 16th century practitioner. Parts of that book were already circulating in Bengal. It had kind of like got out of the, if you like, the restricted circle of of tantric practitioners, and people were, people outside those traditions were getting into this sort of stuff. And that was kind of like, that parts of that book got translated in the 1880s by an Indian member of the Theosophical Society. And I think that at first, Theosophists were, were fascinated with this material. But the big problem was, as far as they were concerned, is that this was coming out of the Tantras. And Tantra in India and in Europe at that time had a very bad reputation. Yeah. That was partly the result of, if you like, colonial era, era scholarship, partly the result of the colonial authorities who sought tantric practitioners as kind of like antithetical, if you like, to the, the 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 governance of India, and partly because of the the reputation Tantra had as being, you know, black magic and bizarre sexual rituals. Mm. 
And what seemed to happen is that Madame Blavatsky, in particular, was initially open to tantric ideas, and then she soon decided it was bad. You know, Blavatsky is an interesting character because, like, as was very popular in that period, a lot of people felt that India was the wellspring of esoteric knowledge. You know, fine. A lot of people felt that, you know, the original Indian religious tradition was monotheistic, rational, you know, a kind of like Indian version of Protestant Christianity. Mm -hmm. But what had happened is that that noble background, if you like, had collapsed. And what we had was idol worship and evil priests and off fooling people. Max Muller, one of the uh, famous Indological scholars at the time, said that India had fallen into the groveling worship of cows and monkeys. That was a kind of like very much a prevailing attitude amongst a lot of Western intellectuals. And I think as much as Blavatsky saw India as a wellspring of the esoteric tradition, she too felt that contemporary Indians had kind of like lost contact with that. You know, this is a very popular idea in, in, if you like, in 18th and 19th century Orientalism. People were just going through the motions. They didn't really understand the, you know, the, the roots of their own religion. And Blavatsky decided that a lot of the tantric material just couldn't be trusted. It was, it was black magic. You know? She has this thing that because the tantric traditions work with the, with the base chakra, and she had this idea that you know, the base chakra was about material stuff and, and the body and other things that were not quite palatable, if you like, to theosophy. They wanted everything to be spiritual. So she kind of put out these pronouncements that the, the tantras are, you know, are not to be read, they're not to be trusted, and they are kind of like black magic, if you like. Right, right. And very, what happened very quickly is that theosophists kind of like embraced ideas of the chakras, threw out anything that didn't suit them, and started to say, well, you know, the energy material is just one interpretation of a of a larger, if you like, esoteric tradition that comes from, I don't know, Atlantis or somewhere, you know. It's just one example of it. And, you know, we, or other Madame Blavatsky, have the keys to that, the truth of that tradition. So there were a lot of arguments with Indian members of the, of the Theosophical Society who disagreed with it. But basically, you know, she was absolutely right and everybody else was wrong. Right. It's, so you also kind of have this element, even though we, we do have lots of Indian members of the Theosophical Society, right? You have a lot. The, the, the organization is founded in America. It's, it's mostly people from the West, from Europe and the Americas. And they're actually coming to India and telling people there that they're, they're getting their own religion wrong. Is it, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, when they first go to India, they they receive very well because they they seem to be taking an interest in Indian religion. They were anti-Christian, or at least anti the activities of Christian missionaries. Mm -hmm. You know, as you probably know, there was a, a great there was a move within some Western Christian movements to try and Christianize India, of course. obviously for the good of the people. And um, Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott kind of like said, no, you know, we have to, we have to understand the Indian religion and value it for what it is. But that didn't seem to last very long. And, it, it, you know, it, it's complicated. Well, eventually they they decided that, Madame Blavatsky decided that she was right about everything. I mean, there was, there was one guy called Subba Rao, a very influential Indian member of the Theosophical Society. And... She and he have a, have a protracted argument that goes on for months and months and months through the pages of the Theosophical Journal because Madame Blavatsky asserts that there are seven tapvats. He says, no, that's, that's wrong. And she's, abs no, no, there are seven tapvats, there are seven tapvats. This, I, I've read all this correspondence and it starts off quite kind of like benevolently that, you know, Super Roy's trying to see her point of view, but... Eventually, he kind of like, no, you know, you, you're wrong, and he left, which is kind of unfortunate because he was a very influential person at the time. Well, she insisted Belvera seven tablets. There are actually considerable more than seven chapters, but because 
people have actually felt that everything was sevenfold. You know, seven's a very important number in Western esotericism. Mm -hmm. Everything had to be seven. And I think this is one reason why this idea of that there are seven chakras kind of like stuck in people's minds. Because obviously, you know, you can relate lots and lots of things to seven chakras. The idea that there's five or nine or 12 or whatever doesn't fit that model quite so well. Absolutely. So in your book, you actually kind of talk about, you know, that the theosophy is, is an ongoing movement. There's different thinkers in it. You sort of talk about the evolution of, of the ideas of chakras in different theosophical thinkers, to be honest. Yeah. But can we talk about how Blavatsky and the, the early theosophists understood chakras? Well, as I said, they had this idea of the higher the chakra, the more spiritual it is. You know, a, a uh, a very powerful theme in, in theosophy was, was getting away from the things of the body. It's always kind of like a sort of a phobia of, of the body and the, and the sensual body in particular. And I think early theosophists found the idea of chakras very alluring because it was a way of, you know, they came out with all these massive, really complicated schemas for linking up the astral body, the etheric body, and so on and so forth. And I think chakras fitted very well for them into that, into explaining how the material body and the astral body and the theric body and the different planes of existence all, all fit together. So that, you know, that was a very early idea. And then, of course, later theosophical writers modified that in particular ways. You know, the two examples I've got in the book of James M. Price, which I know you want to talk about, and yeah. Charles Webster Ledbetter. Well, let's jump into that next day. A slightly later theosophist, even though he became very close friends with Blavatsky, is the James Morgan Price that you just mentioned. He, he wrote a, a very interesting book called The Apocalypse Unsealed, which which I find it to be a fun read. I don't know about the ideas in it, if they're quote unquote true, practical, useful, but it's a, it, it's a great read. So can you tell us about this, this very unique and interesting book and what it has to do with chakras? It's a very, and you're right. Jonathan, it's a very interesting book, and I think there's perhaps not been enough work done on price. I was rereading it this morning, and I thought, yeah, that, you know, that we need, I need to go back and do some more work on this. It's basically a retranslation of the Revelation of St. John. Mm -hmm. And his argument is that uh, this is not a prophetic book of the Bible. It's not about something that's going to happen, which is, of course, how a lot of people took it. But it's actually a spiritual philosophy. And he drags in quite a lot of, I think, Neoplatonic ideas in there, esoteric Christian ideas, and chakras. And what he does with the chakras, he, he kind of he relates the chakras to various of the elements in in Revelations, various of the esoteric symbolism, if you like, and also to the, I think it's the nerve plexuses of the body. And this is very much an idea that was current at the time, that the, the seven chakras related to nerve plexuses. Eventually, that was superseded by the endocrine system. So first, chakras get related to the nerve plexuses, then the endocrine system. And what Price does is he creates this, if you like, syncretic spiritual philosophy out of the Book of Revelation, Neoplatonism, and what he knows about Indian philosophy and chakras. It is very interesting work. And, you know, I don't believe there's been a biography of Price done, but he was a, he was a fascinating figure. You know, he was American, and he got involved in theosophical publishing quite early on. He ran, I think he ran the Adyar Press for a while, and he was very close friends with Blavatsky. According to people who know him, he, he, you know, he was a genuine adept. But, yeah, it's a very interesting book. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, you mentioned Alistair Crowley in passing, but what did he think of chakras? Uh, use them, teach them, write about them, and, and contribute to other esotericists' understandings from their okay. uh, I think well, ideas. What's interesting about Crowley and chakras, I guess, is that at a time when a lot of East, Western esoteric people thought that yoga, and I'm talking like physical postural yoga, was at best, a waste of time, and at worst, a form of black magic. I mean, that was a very popular idea. A lot of theosophists just don't like yoga. Crowley, of course, goes out and studies yoga in, in what's now Sri Lanka, and then incorporates yoga into his, if you like, his, his, his Western magical system. It, it doesn't, it's not a straight lift. He changes a lot in the process. 
but that's quite notable. And Crowley was, I think, influenced by a guy called Sabapati Swami, who's a kind of like a lost figure in, in the history of the chakras. That it, it's only, his work has only just come to, to light recently, and that's because of a, a scholar called Keith Cantu, who's been doing a lot, a lot of work on Sabapati Swami. Uh, Sabapati Swami kind of like makes it, pops up in the late 1880s. And he produced this book called A Book of, I think it's called A Book of Raj Yoga. And he's got 12 chakras. And his idea about the chakras is that you have to conquer them and almost dissolve them. Again, very, very different to how we think of chakras nowadays. He actually met Colonel Olcott and Madame Blavatsky, but they didn't get on with him. You can actually see elements of Savapati's ideas in Price's book, because Price talks about conquering the chakras, and that's definitely something that Sabapati Swami talks about in his work. But Crowley seems to have been very impressed by Sabapati Swami. Um, he brings all, he, of all the Western esoterists, he's actually the first person to actually create practical exercises for chakras. Okay. And he does this in, in Libra, I think Libra SSS is an important one, and the SSS stands for Swami Sabapati Whatever. Uh, sorry. Yeah. And Crowley is also the first person to, if you like, put chakras on the tree of life, which became a hugely popular thing later. He does some strange things. He he, he works out by Gamaltria that the number of the Sahasrara chakra, this is the topmost chakra on the crown or above the crown of the head, depending on who you read, he says it, it's, you know, he's commonly known as the thousand petaled lotus. Crowley says he's worked out by Gamatria that it isn't a thousand, it's 960, which, oh no, a oh, no, thousand and one, sorry, somebody else who does the 960, which seems an odd way of establishing your authority, but there you go. Also, at some point, he decided there was a, an anal chakra and a clitoris chakra and a vaginal chakra, very Crowley and fits in with these ideas of the sensuous system of, of the body. Yeah. So, you know, Crowley again is producing a, a syncretic version of the chakras that fits in with his ideas about Western magic. Yeah, I think his, his work has been very influential in terms of. I mean, I started to get involved in the occult in the in the late seventies, and you couldn't actually open a, a book on occultism without finding something about chakras in it. Often it would just be a list, you know, of like, this is the Muladhara chakra, it has this in the centre, it has these data on the petals, da 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 and nothing would be explained. You know, it, it was just, I think it was just a summary of, of Sir John Woodruff's book, The Serpent Power. But chakras became, an, if you like, an indelible part in Western esotericism. Yeah. So, you know, I, I can imagine the sort of situation where a publisher looks at a new guy's books. Well, you know, you really need a book on chakras. You really need a chapter on chakras, kid, or at least mention them because, you know, chakras are, are cool. Yeah, you need to sprinkle in the chakras. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it's, it, it is omnipresent. So I think that knowing this history, understanding this history is is really important and, and just inherently interesting. You, you know, this is this is definitely a show, Talk Gnosis. We have all kinds of episodes. We have long episodes. We have short episodes. But we definitely like to to get into the weeds. We, we yeah. definitely like to to drill down. And I, I think sometimes that is some of the things that is preset for my brain, things that I like. But again, I, I really want to emphasize that this is something I think most people will find interesting is your book because the history is just so interesting. And the transformation of the ideas is just a good illustration of how ideas move around and radically change. And I'm not even talking about esoteric ideas, Phil. I just mean ideas in, in cultures. Yeah, uh, that's what like. Yeah. So following the Theosophists, and this is something else that you're going to see when you pick up the your New Age book, right? When they sprinkle in the chakras, is that, that, that this is not a a tantric self-Asian system, but but actually is something that is omnipresent in every religion. You can find some ideas that are like chakras or identical to chakras in cultures that have no contact with what self-Asian tantric thought. There's lots of problems with this idea, but but I want to get a little bit more specific 
which is, are there any Western equivalents of bringing deities into the body in the way that there is in, in Tantra, in a way that is, quote-unquote, more authentically close to the ideas of chakras? That's a very interesting question, Joel. To be honest, I don't know. But, you know, I've spent the last quarter of a century or so studying the Shiva Tantras, and I'm kind of a bit, I don't know, a bit out of touch with the Western stuff. But... I mean, you know, there's there's analogs, there's bringing a deity into your body through possession or drawing down the moon in Wicca. But as for placing different deities in different parts of the body, I really don't know. I think you know, I've I've only encountered that in in the in the uh, in the tantric traditions. But it wouldn't be surprised me if if that's an idea that people have drawn with. What fascinates me about one of the things that fascinates me about this whole history is the whole the idea that there are deities in the chakras disappears really quickly. Yeah. You know, Lavazzi doesn't like the worship of images. She sees it as idolatry, so I think she's kind of down on it. And there's also this idea, you know, I talk about this in the book, that there are deities on the petals. You'll sometimes see these on, on visual images of chakras that are kind of like little... Sanskrit letters, and uh, those letters are seed syllables that the, if you like, full names of the Sanskrit alphabet, which are which are deities, because you have this this extensive, if you like, sonic mysticism in tantra, where you know, words are sacred, obviously as mantras, but also syllables are mantras, and mantras are deities, and you know, this is one of the things that got me interested because. This is all back decades, but I was I was I'd taken one of Sir John Woodruff's illustrations. I think it was the Muladhara Chakra, and I was blowing it up for a workshop. I I don't know what I was going to say, but it, it suddenly struck me that the this drawing of the of the Muladhara Chakra was like a yantra. Now I just started to learn about yantras from my from my tantric teacher, and. I, you know, a yantra is a kind of like enclosure which has got different circles of deities in it, to give you the simple idea. You've got the presiding de or the chief deity in the center, in the bindu, and she, she or he is surrounded by circles of, of kind of like, if like emanations of that deity representing different aspects of it. Some of these yantras are extremely complex. And I kind of looked at this drawing of the, of the Muladhara and thought, that's a yantra. You know, all the symbolism in it, which I'd never seen explained, must mean something. Mm. And as I say, the Sanskrit letters on the petals are sea syllable deities. And that idea went almost immediately. You know, uh, when Charles Webster Ledbetter wrote his book on the chakras, a chakras, a monograph, I think written in 1924, he kind of like concluded the idea that. Well, he, he thought there were moral qualities related to the chakra. And he cannot conclude that completely. And again, Ledbet is interesting because he came up with this idea of the sacral chakra, a uh, chakra in the sacral region, rather than the one that's near the genitals, because he, like a lot of theosophists, had a complete down on, on, on anything sexual or, or sensuous, if you like. So to avoid the, the possible dangers of of uh, awakening the sexual chakra he come up with a, a sacra a chakra in the sacral region and you'll still see shit that in some new age books well unfortunately it's it's time that we we should start wrapping up so i have a, a final question even though there's, there's a lot more to talk about a lot more in the book as you mentioned you you get more into lead better you get into jung which is very interesting but but your book is is one of history but as a practitioner do you think practices that that use this sort of misunderstood recreate up I said recreated and then in, in my notes, in my questions, I also said just straight up created Western understandings of the chakras. Like, can these still be of, of spiritual or magical value? Or if I'm someone who's interested in chakras, should I find a guru, take the vows and formally study Tantra? Like, what would you recommend? I think they are of value. Now, I, I didn't write, I was very careful when I wrote the book not to poo-poo any of the Western stuff or just like it's all made up bollocks, you know. I think it's it's interesting for people to know the history, but if if you're happy to work with one of these modern 20th century, if you like, chakra schemas, then that's fine. 
Because after all, what are these schemas about? They're about enabling us to experience our bodies in ways that we're perhaps not used to, to organize that experience and to make it part of our spiritual journey. Uh, that's a, that can be a very fluid thing, and it can, you know, I, I think when it comes to magical practice, what matters is not whether something is authentic or not, you know, not whether you can trace its history back, you know, a zillion years. It's whether you emotionally engage with it. And if, you know, if, you, if you're happy to work with a modern Western chakra system, so long as you know it's a modern Western chakra system, I think that's fine. You know, it's, I hate to sound like a, a Dewey and pragmatic, pragmatist, but it's what, what works for you. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, there are different options over. You could even make your own system up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, Phil, it's been an enlightening interview. Uh, I'm really glad that we, we got to connect and uh, talk. So again, we, we already gave the plug for the book at the top of the show, but I've been putting up your website, but for the people who are listening, it's enfolding.org. And uh, you actually have a blog post about the, the chakras there as well, right? I do, yeah. Uh, it's easy. So I've been doing unfolding since about 2009 and uh, you'll find all my latest wibblings about various subjects on there including tantra theosophy chakras yada 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 and there are links to the to the books i published by my own books and other people's so yeah go visit my blog you can sign up for my Substack newsletter there which comes out every time i feel i have something to announce it's been great talking to you jonathan thanks very much for having me on the show yeah thanks Okay, bye Phil. Okay, everybody.